Welcome to our presentation on the uh, Community Wildfire Protection Plan. I'd like to ask if you uh, be seated so we can get started. You should have it th at this point that uh, we would ask that you uh, sign in. Back at the rear table, there is a form that will be asking you to identify fire concerns in and around your home or your property. Be sure you've got a copy of that, and there should be an abundant supply of pencils so you can work on the, on the board. Okay, well welcome. We're, uh, we're glad to have you here. We have a very interesting presentation for you today. And again, uh, we'd like to be sure that you've signed in and be sure that you pick up a form that uh, outlines some of the fire concerns that you might have in and around your place and the things that you uh, consider uh, important. It's a, it's a form, I think it's self-explanatory, but we will be talking about it in a little bit. What we're going to talk about today, this is a special community meeting that uh, that's under the auspices of TSRA and John Fox uh, felt it was very important that we have a separate meeting that, that we dedicate to this. It's the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. Uh, today we're going to hear about the process of what it is and uh, why we think that this would be of value to TSRA and how it uh, might complement our current uh, fuels management program. And I'd also, as we get started, I'd like to alert you to a couple of upcoming events. One is written on the bulletin board over here that there, there will be a follow-up meeting to this presentation, which will actually be a, a workshop format where we're going to deal with very specific issues and we're going to present uh, the information that you're putting on those forms will eventually become a database that will help us prioritize and allocate, allocate uh, fire prevention resources. So that's the purpose of that form, and in this workshop, we'll be, uh, we'll be working through that data. Uh, the second event that's coming up, uh, there's a handout back on the table there. April 28th, the Native Plant Committee is going to be talking about doing a presentation on planting and maintaining uh, and maintenance for fire retardancy. So that's a related topic, and that's a good thing to get on your calendar now. So what I'd like to do so we can get started is ask our speakers to introduce themselves with their name and title, and then I will run through the agenda that, we're, that we'll be following. So why don't we start back at this end with, with Bill. Bill Wiemeyer, Association Director of Compliance and Environmental Management. Okay. And now, having said that, I'd like our speakers to stand. I know that if you're all seated, it's hard for us to <laughs> All right, I should have mentioned that first. All right, uh, next, Carla, are you open? I'm Carly Ohm, Sapphire. I work uh, with Fire Safe Sonoma, also with the Sonoma County Department of Emergency Services, and Fort Ross Volunteer Public. And I'm here to talk about the Community Wildfire Protection Program today. Okay, so Carly Ohm is our leader on this process, and she's our expert, and she's being, so let's move down to the table then. John Fox, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Dan Levin, the Senior Fire Department. Yeah, that's the State Department of Forestry Department. Okay, good. Now, yeah. all right. What we're going to do then in this meeting is at first that uh, John Fox is going to talk a little bit about some of our our objectives and how this fits with some of the other programs and why it's important. Uh, Chief Levin is going to kind of give us an overview of the big picture. And then we're going to get right to the, uh, the presentation of, about the process and just what is a community uh, wildfire protection plan. And Bill Wiemeyer is going to also be talking about the fuel management. So you can see how these two programs uh, complement each other. We'll then take a short break. It'll be about 3 o'clock by that time. And then we'll have a Q&A. And then just a brief wrap up and summary and action item next steps. So let us get started then with uh, and ask John to come to the microphone. Thanks. 
Thank you, Jim. I'd like to thank everybody for coming this afternoon. I'd also like to thank uh, our associates from the Fire Department and from the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection and from Fire Safe Sonoma and the County uh, Office of Emergency Services for making the trek up here to be with us this afternoon. It's very much appreciated. I thought that what I would try to do in just a few minutes is uh, set the discussion for today and the work that we're going to be asking you to do today uh, into a context of the overall Sea Ranch risk reduction um, and disaster response capabilities. Obviously, to me, since I've only been here 18 months, this work uh, long predates me and has been on a path of slow and progressive building. And uh, I just think that's tremendous. A lot has been achieved and there is more still to achieve. The uh, components of the Sea Ranch risk reduction and uh, emergency disaster response programs, I thought I would enumerate them because taken together as, as a package, uh, they're really quite impressive. There is, of course, the Sea Ranch Fuels Management Plan, uh, which began, I understand, in 2002, of which Bill Wiemeyer is going to be discussing this afternoon, which has now been going on for a number of years to the point where we are re-entering areas that were cleared uh, when the program first began. That is a very well-researched, thoroughly documented program for reducing fire risk at the Sea Ranch. In 2004, the board, with advice and input from many people, uh, approved the Sea Ranch Emergency Response Plan. And of course, during this time also, there was a task force created to consider how to deploy emergency water resources at the time of an emergency. When I arrived a uh, year and a half ago, uh, we set about the process of converting the emergency response plan into a disaster operations capability where people are assigned to various uh, duties to organize and assist at the time of a major disaster. There are something of the order of 200 sea ranchers involved in that volunteer effort at this time. And it's coming along nicely, and by the end of this year, we hope that it will be complete. And then, of course, the challenge becomes to keep it up to date and to maintain it. In 2006, the board created, asked me to create a new group, which at that time was called uh, the Forest Fire Risk Reduction Group. And the purpose of this effort is to examine possible enhancements to our fire risk mitigation strategies and to the fuel management plan. And uh, this, of course, is the subject of this afternoon's discussion. Conversations within this uh, risk reduction group, I think, have resulted at this point in a decision to rename that effort to the Sea Ranch Fire Safe Council, which is what we intend to become. And there are several reasons for that. One is to bring us into alignment with the general state effort for community <coughs> wildfire protection, and also to perhaps make uh, grant funding more easily attainable. The Sea Ranch Fire Department, which comprises the Sea Ranch Volunteer Fire Department and the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, for a number of years has been carrying out property inspections for the purpose of helping residents see to what degree uh, we are maintaining defensible space around our properties and advising us on what needs to be done to uh, bring us into compliance with the Public Resources Code, which is effective in that area, which carries the easily remembered number 4291. <coughs> We are currently searching for funds to expedite 
the property inspection program. It's a rather arduous process for 2,290 properties at the Sea Ranch. So we're looking for ways to accelerate that effort. And uh, we have some goals in mind that would uh, allow us to reach every property at the Sea Ranch in a much shorter time than has been the case in the past. There are many other committees and efforts that are involved in this uh, general goal of improving our safety. The Native Plant Committee, for example, is uh, having a meeting shortly to discuss the planting and maintenance of fire retardant or fire resistant plants. In the Sea Ranch budget, which is currently in process and will go finally to the board on February the 24th. There are a couple of proposals there which uh, in our minds uh, fit well with this general plan. One is to uh, create an association director of emergency management to take o o overall responsibility for the uh, thinking and execution of our entire emergency programs here at Sea Ranch. We are also proposing uh, to purchase a mass communication system that would give us the maximum chance at the time of an emergency to, to communicate information and advice to uh, every Sea Ranch owner and hopefully every Sea Ranch resident, um, regardless of where they are. We think this is important because of the fragile nature of uh, communications here on the North Coast. And now, bringing, bringing us to the subject of this afternoon, we're going to be hearing from Kelly and Safford about the first steps of initiating a community wildfire protection plan that build upon, that would build upon uh, the fuels management efforts of the past. Our purposes then this afternoon, and in connection with this program, are to identify what needs to be done. We don't know yet what needs to be done, and we need to go through a process to identify what, what those steps will be, to establish the priorities of what needs to be done, and then uh, hopefully to provide a budget to support those goals and objectives. So this is the beginning of a new process or a new step in the overall attainment of Sea Ranch, uh, improved Sea Ranch safety. And the one thing that I would like to leave you with as I turn over the microphone to my esteemed leader and colleague, Darren Levin, is that all of what we're doing is collaborative. It is going to require collaborative efforts uh, from community members, staff, uh, committees, and the fire uh, jurisdictions which support us. Our DCEM department. All of us are going to have to work together to uh, bring these things about. And uh, if we all participate, I think the results are just going to be spectacular. Thank you, John. 
John, um, for making public safety a priority in this community. Um, when John first came, uh, we met, and he explained that that, that was one of his uh, highest concerns. And it's been wonderful for public safety people like me to work with John because he listens and moves forward. He gets things done. So I, I, I really appreciate him quite properly. Um, what is the big picture? The big picture is that we live in California, which burns. Everybody knows that. Twenty years ago, we had to convince the senior board that if, if there were a fire on the senior, it could spread beyond the roads. If it occurred in the we actually had arguments about it. This community understands that this place can burn. What's important to understand, though, or important to have as a perspective about the relative risk. I heard somebody was uh, talking about the fires that burned in Malibu last week. Uh, there were three uh, or five houses uh, that went off, a couple of celebrity houses, and they drew a parallel between the Sea Ranch and Malibu. There really is no parallel except they're both on Highway 1. But the weather <laughs> and the terrain are entirely different, and they're entirely different animals. Now, I mean, down there is a desert. This is a rainforest. That doesn't mean that things don't burn, but they burn in different pattern. They burn at different times, and they don't burn with the intensity that Southern California burns. We don't have Santa Ana winds. We're on the lee side of a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of ridges that attenuate uh, those high pressure winds that they come over. So we, you can't compare us to any place else, really. Um, and I think it's important to go into this planning process um, with respect for fire, but not fear, um, and, uh, and not hysteria. Absolute rational thinking, collaborative thinking um, is the way we're going to get the most done. And it's also what we're best at in this community. I mean, we've got a pretty good history of uh, collaboratively solving problems. And this is just another problem. It's one that's close to my heart, but uh, it's just another thing that has to be solved. <laughs> so the last thing I'd like to leave you with is the notion that your safety in a wildfire starts with you and ends with you. It's your clearance around your home, your managing of the vegetation under your authority. In other words, the stuff that's on your property um, will determine whether your house lives or dies. And it doesn't it almost doesn't matter what happens uh, away from you. If your house is, is well protected, if you have good defensible space, you can, your house can survive almost anything. Now, that doesn't mean it will, okay? But it certainly means that um, that's where the boundaries are drawn, right in your, your own work. So keep that in mind. Um, we're going to talk about compliance with 4291, but the main event is going to be We've had a number of late uh, people come in. Uh, there actually are more chairs in the closet back there if you want to take a few out. And those for the latecomers, be sure you get one of those forms that's on the back page, on uh, the back table, that lists uh, issues in and around your property. Okay, we'll now uh, move to the main part of the agenda, which is Connie on Sapford and Bill Wiemeyer. Uh, and, and be sure you sign in, too, so we have uh, contact information. Hello. Thanks you guys all for coming today. I know it's, it's Saturday, you probably could have found something else to do that maybe would have been more fun. So we really appreciate that uh, you're taking the time to do this. Um, the reason that I'm starting this program, I'm just a few words of background. First off, my name. I put it up there on purpose because I know I have a hard name. And I know it's hard for people to remember, so hey you, usually that's me, <laughs> and I'll respond to that. Um, but it's Carol Young, um, and I'm here to talk to you today about uh, the Sonoma County Community Wildfire Protection Plan. Um, it's kind of a little bit complicated. Uh, this, this whole process started when um, <clears throat> wearing my hat as a 
Fort Ross volunteer firefighter, I got a fuels mitigation gram for my response area, which is the ridges up above Fort Ross. Um, and as part of that grant, there was a little checkbox on the, on the grant application. And that checkbox says, is there a CWPP in place? And I had to make a bunch of phone calls and what is this CWPP thing anyway? And it turns out that what it is is something that all of the federal grant programs are demanding that be in place for you to be considered for federal funds. And so I said, oh, okay, well, I'll put a checkbox that says in progress and I'll start writing one. That's how I got here. Um, so I was sort of, originally this started as a, with my wearing my Fort Ross volunteer firefighter hat. Um, today, really, I'm more wearing my hat as the executive coordinator for Fire Safe Sonoma, which is a countywide fire safe council. Um, and our mission is to improve wildland fire safety out there in the wildland urban interface. And I'll explain what that is in a second. Don't worry. Um, my third hat that I wear is um, I work for the Sonoma County Department of Emergency Services. Right now, my primary responsibility down there is I'm working on sudden oak death outreach education and research. Um, but I also do um, some uh, vegetation management code compliance inspections for them, along with Pete Martin, who's out there somewhere. Um, so those are the things that I do. <clears throat> Here's what we're going to talk about today. The Community Wildfire Protection Plan, where it came from, background, where it has to contain, how the process might work. Um, I need to say at this point that how I'm doing this, really, honestly, is you guys are my my guinea pig community. Um, and the reason I chose you specifically is that there is such high interest at the Sea Ranch in fire issues. Um, you have a well-organized uh, population. You have good communication sources. You already have a fuels management plan. So you are really the first place, the best place for me to start. Um, ultimately, the Sea Ranch plan will be folded into the Zone 4 plan, which is comprises the um, fire response areas of Sea Ranch, Timber Cove, and uh, Fort Ross and Annapolis. That's the one. And uh, so ultimately, we'll have a Zone 4 CWPP, which will in turn be enfolded into a countywide CWPP. Um, scheduled for completion about 16 months from now, and that's a sort of thought. Um, at this point, I'm still in the really beginning stages. I'm, I'm learning too. So if you see flaws in my argument somewhere, please point them out. And I'll I can't get the answer for you today, I'll have it for you the next meeting. Um, so that's what we talked about first is the CWPP itself, and then I'll move into some basic fire behavior information, and um, basically what I wanted to do with uh, this, this second half of my program here is sort of give you some, some food for thought so that as you fill out the form that's in, in your hand, you'll have some, some background information for that. Okay, the Community Welfare Protection Plan. It was uh, originally mandated as part of the Healthy Forest Restoration Act, or the HFRA, as I may refer to it. Um, basically, the function of it was to improve the capacity of the Secretary of Agriculture and Interior to um, conduct hazardous fuels reduction projects, um, mostly on, on, on federal land, but also um, it's aimed at protecting communities, watersheds, and certain other at risks land from catastrophic wildfire, and that's where we come in. Um, um, those priority areas include the wildland urban interface and intermix, watersheds and areas impacted by lintro, insects, or disease. Now, what's this wildland urban interface thing anyway? Um, quite simply, all it is, is is a place where you have wildland fuels and home fuels and existing in the same place. Now, quickly, fuel, when I say fuel, I don't mean it's a can of gasoline. Um, to firefighters, fuel is anything that will burn. And that includes your home, just as well as it does a juniper bush or a redwood tree. Fuel is anything that will burn. So when you hear me say fuels, don't be envisioning the, uh, the can of gas. So the WUI, or the Wildland Urban Intermix, which is what you guys are, is quite simply a place where you have a mixture of those two fuels. That's very, very important because the wildland urban interface is the area that the Healthy Forest Restoration Act developed the CWPP process to talk about. In other words, the CWPP addresses the WUI, 
and stuff that's going on in the movie. I won't be writing a CWPP for downtown Santa Rosa. This is just for areas where you have wildland fuels and homes in proximity. Um, the CWPP process also allows us to define the boundary um, of our wooey areas, which is pretty important because that will um, allow you sometimes to go on, especially federal land, to create um, hazard, hazardous fuels reduction projects that don't protect the community. The minimum requirements for the CWPP are that it's collaborative <coughs> and it's developed with input with, from the federal, the state, the local agencies, as well as community members, groups, watershed councils, environmental groups, tribes, you name it. Everybody's supposed to be involved in this process. Um, it has to have prioritized fuels reductions programs, um, which, in other words, it makes recommendations to set priorities for projects that will help to increase community welfare, safety, life. Um, we want to cut down the roadside vegetation because it's impacting the safety of our evacuation routes. That's a project. Um, and ultimately, that will be prioritized. And so that's what the CWPP has to do. It also has to treat structural ignitability, um, which is to say it needs to make recommendations to community members about what you can do to help make your home more ignition resistant. <clears throat> this is much more a part of the dialogue in um, fire prevention now than it was even five years ago. No one really talked much about this. Everybody talked about vegetation, vegetation, and now people are saying people need to take responsibility for their homes as well. Uh, finally, I'll get the CWPP signed off by the CDF unit chief for New Loveless, by local fire agencies, and by the entire county board of supervisors. So that's the process. And so how do we do all this? <clears throat> this form um, that you have in your hand, that's really what this what that form is about. It's figuring out how we're going to um, pull together the information, the input of the community that I need for the process. Um, <clears throat> And so what we're going to be doing is we'll be looking first at um, where are the community structures or areas that are at risk as perceived by you, the community, and by firefighting professionals as well. Then we'll look at the fuel hazards that are associated with those areas. These fuel hazards um, will be almost entirely coming off of um, CDF, FRAP data there, um, which so these fuel hazards exist. Um, this map up here is actually the fuel models and fuel hazard risk models from CDF. So you can check that out at the break. Um, next we'll be looking at the risk of wildfire occurrence. That's what's the likelihood of ignition, what's the fire history, all those sorts of questions. Um, what is the structural ignitability? That could either be on a community-wide level or on a structure-specific level. Um, <clears throat> firefighting capability really just talks about how long is it going to take for the firefighters to get there? What kind of resources do they have when they get there? Do they have enough water? Are they enough? So then you look at that and that. You use all of those categories to come up with an overall risk component. Um, next, you're going to kind of do an overall community priority. Same structure. What's the overall risk? We're taking that from the page before. What's the community value? If 15 of you write the same thing down, the chapel is very, very important to me. Then that obviously is going to have a pretty high community value. Um, cultural value is quite simply if it's a historic structure or archaeological site. And um, that will give it its overall priority rate. Next, we're going to look at what are the projects that we can undertake that will reduce the risk to that structure. Um, is it going to be, you know, you know, this is the type of career event, are we going to go out there with hand saws and cut down brush, or are we going to do prescribed fire? Then um, a little more specific about how this project will be carried out. Um, and then this is the overall priority of the project. So that went over pretty quick. Does everybody kind of get what that was? So that's what we're doing, is we're trying to identify the problems, ultimately come up with the solutions, and prioritize them. And that's somewhat close, I think, to how it's going to work. <clears throat> and that's what this form is for. Um, I'm asking you to identify structures and risk and commercial structures, and it goes on and on and on. Um, these categories are, uh, these are good categories. If you think of other things, put them in there. Right? Write down whatever you want to write down. Um, they can be streets, they can be whole areas, they can be, you know, write down whatever you want. Um, how do you perceive the level of risk? Um, if you have a doctoral dissertation you want to write on why that is, you put it on the back of the page. But it can only be a paragraph. <laughs> uh, and, once again, and then why do you perceive the risk that you do? Is it because it's a vegetation problem? Is it because it's a vegetation and a slow problem, in which case you can put two checks in there? 
or if it's something else, write that. And again, you can use the back of the sheet. So that's how this is going to work. And the more data you put on here, the happier I'll be right away. Um, okay. Any questions about that part of the program? Moving on into a few words about fire and fire behavior and risk factors. Um, <coughs> first, I should let you know, my house is right here. And this is after the Great Ridge Fire in 1978. So this is all a very real uh, topic to me. This is sort of you know, part of my life. Um, I support Ross Firefighter. I'm a mutual aid responder to the Sea Ranch, too. So your fire safety is also important to me because I'm a very reluctant firefighter. I don't really want to fight fires and I can help it. So, um, <coughs> this is actually a little fire to see. Um, this is the Sonoma County Fire History map that I got from uh, Marshall Turpeville at CDF. Um, you are up here in the little box. A um, couple of things to point out. Uh, yard arm fire, we've been where? Down here somewhere. Um, too small to actually get onto the map. These are 100 and plus acre fires. Um, this is the Salt Point fire right here. Um, you know, the, the, the thing to really notice about the Sea Ranch goes back to what Darren was saying. And that's that, you know, your, your fire history, not to downplay the fact that you don't have risk, you do have risk. Um, and in some cases, you have fairly high risk. But your fire history is, there, there's not much fire history here. Most of the fires have been very small uh, between CDF and, and, and uh, Sea Ranch Fire, and of course Fort Ross. <laughs> um, we get them out pretty quick, and we've been pretty successful with that. Um, so, you know, it's not to say you don't have risk, but I can guarantee you that if you were looking at a picture of Malibu, you would see an awful lot more big old spots on the map. So I think that's a really good thing to remember. Yes, you have risk, but yeah, you have a lot of potential for doing a lot of good as well. And that's important. Um, my fire, this is my fire, the green thing there. That was the Creighton Ridge Fire in 1978. It's about 11,000 acres. Um, and most of the fire history in this area tends to be along the tops of the coastal ridge. Um, and uh, so that's, so there, there, there you have that. So what influences fire behavior? Three major factors, weather, slope, and fuels. Uh, weather, I'm not going to talk about much because that's pretty much a no-brainer. You know, if it's hot and dry and the wind's blowing, that's a bad thing. You got that. Slope um, is very important for fire because slope, uh, fire burns much hotter and faster up hills. Um, you know, the convective winds that come off the fire preheat the fuels, make the fire behavior more intense. And uh, fires raise up slopes pretty good and the fire intensity is much higher on slopes. So it's an important thing to consider when you're thinking about fire. The third thing is obviously fuels. What are the fuels like and how are those going to influence the, the fire? In terms of your, your uh, filling out your, your form there, flat to gentle slope obviously is not much of a concern. And that's a 0 to 20% slope. I know most of you probably don't know it. You can't look at a slope and figure out what it is. I'm getting better at it. I'm usually within you know 10% these days. Um, but the way I think about it is um, you would want to exercise on this hill. You would want to avoid this hill. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Um, another risk factor um, is homes and what they look like and how they are and how the fools are around them. This is actually in my neighborhood, this house. Um, but I want to talk to that guy. Uh, because obviously when you have fuels growing all up around the house, um, you have not only a, a fuel, a, a, the fuel impact in the house issue, but you also have a house fire impact in the wildland issue. That's something that doesn't get talked about too much. Uh, there are a lot of house fires in this country. House fires start wildland fires all the time. So this is sort of the, the dialogue that works both ways. And really what we're talking about there is defensible space. I know most of you know what defensible space is. Um, the two sentences, you know, 100 feet or more where the vegetation is modified so that an approaching wildfire's power is moderated. Pretty simple concept. Um, this is an important thing to know too. Uh, homes without defensible space are a tremendous danger to firefighters. Um, as a matter of fact, the uh, four fires, the firefighters who died in the Mount Santa Sino uh, last summer, that was a, a, a home in the wildland urban interface without adequate defensible space. Um, lack of defensible space is a good enough reason for firefighters to choose not to try to defend your home in the case of a fire. Um, homes are triage, um, and that's a real thing, so it's definitely in your best interest uh, to keep your uh, defensible space up. 
what is this preventable space thing? Think of it in terms of zones um, from going out from the house. You want to turn this kind of forest fuel density oops, into this kind. So we're just getting thinning out the trees so that we don't have trees. Trees keep by now, and they're a little bit thicker in the 50 foot range. Um, you're just kind of reducing the wildland fuels, reducing them a little more in the 30 foot range, and keeping the 10 foot right around your house extremely clean. Um, but we'll talk more about that at the next meeting. Basically, turn that into that. This is actually a photograph from the fuels management project I've had running up at Fort Ross. Um, we're pretty proud of some of the work that we've done. <coughs> Ladder fields are an important thing to discuss. You have a lot of this. This is actually up on Timber Ridge. Um, grass leading into brush, leading into trees. If you have a relatively small fire coming along in the grass, the grass that hits the brush, the brush all of a sudden starts sending out higher flame lengths, ignite the trees. Um, this is sort of a, 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 a laddering process that you want to avoid. Um, so if you see that, especially if you have ladder fields that are like dead tan oak, this is coming your way, so no doubt. Um, and this is sort of the fire behavior that you see as you move from the grasslands up into the trees. So there's something to watch for. Okay, now we're into the science part of the show. You guys ready for this? You guys heard of the Back Porch Laboratory? Mm -hmm. No? Well, I'd like to introduce you to um, our team of scientists. <laughs> <laughs> That's Lucy and Darla. Lucy, um, we use her for all of our standard grass tests. <laughs> The grass hype. Um, but there's only one she's really good at, and that, of course, is the standard poodle test. Darla uh, tests wood durability <laughs> until she gets too sleepy. <laughs> okay, now here's the real science part, and we have real science instruments here, so you guys are going to be impressed. Okay, this is what happens when you don't have ladder tools. You like that science instrument? It may look like a flower frog to you. Um, basically, three matches, one burns, the, the other ones don't even matter. You get ladder fuels in the picture, you're going to need smoky now. Right? Now watch what happens. Tremendously more active fire, and I know these are matches, these are not trees. But in fact, this is pretty much what will happen if you have that really dense understory layer going on in your forest. You're going to get some much more intensive fire behavior, so it's a very good thing to address. <laughs> Removing the ladder fuels. Um, this is also something that I think is really important to talk about. Uh, California is a fire adapted ecosystem. Um, we've always had fire. It's an important part of uh, how our ecosystems work and how the trees grow and reproduce and the species that can't reproduce without fire. And we're, we're excluding fire from our landscape now. Um, we have to because there are too many of us, myself included, who've moved into wildland areas that should be burning every 20 to 50 years. Um, and, it's, and it's sort of too bad. Um, fires, this is another fire. This is a photo actually from the Crater Ridge fire as well. There's no ladder field. You see how this fire is just kind of skunking along the ground. But what it's doing is it's killing off the little baby um, firs and small trees and stuff so that the larger trees have a better chance. The fuels aren't getting so dense on the ground. It's also turning veg vegetative matter into more available nutrients for the trees. So really a lot of what we're talking about is it's a forest health issue. Um, there's a lot of good reasons to have fire in the landscape. I don't know that we'll get to the point where we can be using prescribed fire much, but it'd be a great place to get to. And one of the things that I like to tell people when they're thinking about their defensible space, when I'm out there doing this, I like to kind of think of myself as fire in the landscape. If I was a fire running through this landscape, which trees would I kill off? And what would be gone out of this landscape if I had a small, mellow fire coming through here? And those are the trees that I will <coughs> chainsaw down and chip up and get out of the way. So, <coughs> now here's <coughs> excuse me, a couple of uh, local fire-fitted plants. I love that word, so I always put it in there. But I really should just say fire-prone species that we have in the neighborhood. Manzanita, juvenile dug firs burn really good. They burn real hot, real fast. Um, <coughs> something you do see at the Sea Ranch is um, you know, stands of them where they're just packed in like 10 inches and they're all two inches in diameter and you can't even see through them. Um, you know, those really, I wouldn't want them in my back row. Um, bay trees burn pretty darn good as well. Um, invasive species like scotch brooms, this is terrible stuff, you all know that for all kinds of reasons. Pampas grass, ooh, that's getting really bad up here, especially when the yard on fire was. That's a huge 
huge eradication problem. Scrub oak, tan oak should really be in here because the tan oaks, because they're dying, are becoming quite an issue. Um, this one is a special sea ranch issue because there's a lot of juniper around in these homes. Um, juniper is not only a, it has a lot of volatile oils in it, so it burns pretty hot on its own. But usually, if you chop into your juniper, what you'll find underneath is this layer of dead stuff under there, which is just a nightmare. This stuff burns like crazy. And where you usually see it at the sea ranch, almost always, it's like growing right under somebody's deck. <laughs> okay, so. Thinning vegetation to reduce the intensity of an oncoming fire is a crucial step towards preventing home ignitions. However, what do you see here? This is San Diego in 2003. So what do you notice besides a lot of really sad stories? The trees are still burning. Look at this. Those trees did not burn. These are eucalyptus. This is like everybody's favorite kill that tree species. <laughs> The first time I saw this photograph, I was at a conference in San Diego that was uh, put on by the Urban Foresters. And I happened to be sitting next to an arborist for the city of San Diego. And she said there was a, a pogrom going on. And so they were trying to, people were trying to get them to cut down every tree that grew in San Diego County after this fire season because you know, the, everybody's perception is that it's the trees that are burning down these houses. But in fact, this wasn't the forest carrying the fire. Um, most likely, um, these homes were hours after the uh, fire front had passed um, and moved from house to house to house. Uh, so our homes are a super important consideration in all of this dialogue that we have about fire. It's our homes and the ignitability of our homes that is of primary, primary importance aside from vegetation. Uh, there's another photograph, examples of the same thing. This is the Laguna fire. Now look at all these, all the circles are vegetation, it hasn't burned. Look at that, there's not a house, except for this one. And I've seen pictures of this house, it was very clean. All of the alone sides of the houses, there was no combustible materials that were left right up against the house. The house survived. Everybody else burned up. <coughs> and the vegetation survived. So vegetation is not our only culprit here. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. When you have a, a wildfire, <clears throat> basically <clears throat> what you will have is uh, the fire is going off and you've got a blizzard of embers that are going to be falling down. And they'll pile up literally like snow all around the house, um, especially in places, this is a good thing to watch for when you're out there thinking about fire in your home. Any place where you have an inside corner, all right, so you have a corner that is like this, you're going to get these fire embers that are going to start piling up in that corner. And so if you're looking for places to be extra super careful about where not to let the duff pile up and not to let the junk pile up, look for those places. Think like snow. If snow is going to pile up, it's going to pile up in this corner. Keep those clean. That's really important. Um, so it's not only surrounding vegetation. It's the ignitability of the home and the things right around it. That said, this house is toast, right? Look at that fire. Full on. Crown fire, wooden house. Oops. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this is a crucial, crucial message. Um, you know, it doesn't <laughs> get much worse than that, right, Deanna? <laughs> you think that fire was putting out some heat? Can you imagine? I mean, there was someone here, but someone took this photograph. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But that must have been really hot. I mean, you didn't stand there for very long to take that photograph. Um, but one of the things that um, the, the researcher that I particularly like named Jack Cohen, his, one of his major points is that we as humans, we tend to look at fire and we'll go, oh, it's too hot. We couldn't possibly survive. The reality of uh, even a crown fire like this, yeah, it's going to get 600 degrees, maybe more, but it'll blow past your house in about a minute. And your house isn't going to ignite from that. It would kill us. And so we react to it. But the reality is, is that your house, if you have it clean around so that fire's not going to start under the house next to the walls and start a small amber fire that's going to burn up and take your house, your house can probably survive most of these kinds of incidents. Um, the likelihood of us getting a full-blown crown fire like this up here is fairly low. Hard to say, but that's extreme fire behavior. So taking steps to reduce the ignitability of the house is equally as important.
important as reducing the amount of education. <laughs> yeah. See, I can't help talking about prevention because really I'm a prevention dweeb, you know, and I'm doing this plan, but I love the prevention stuff. So let's get back to the CWPP thing. So that's what we're trying to do, is tabulate the responses to this so that we can start looking at all of the things that are going on with your vegetation, with your risks. What do you guys think of them? Make plans, come up with solutions. Piece of cake, right? But today our focus uh, isn't really going to be on the solution, so as we're in the question and answer series and as we're collecting information, um, we're not going to be talking too much about the solutions. We're going to be trying to identify the problems. Um, the discussion about the solution will be at the next meeting, which is on March 10th. Um, so that's what we are um, hoping to do, is identify the things you're concerned about and go from there. Here's some of the um, broad category issues that um, I'd like to be thinking about as we have that next um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the fuels and vegetation management plan. Um, how do you feel that's going? What's up with it? I think you have a great vegetation management plan. I think you've done tremendous things. And I'll tell you what, you look for other vegetation management plans in the state and the country, but there aren't many to look at. I'll tell you that. Um, <clears throat> what are the environmental and vegetation management? BM, sorry about that. Vegetation management and fire. Those might be things that we might want to talk about. Um, abatement issues, um, which Fundamentally means, do you feel like people are confined to 4291? Are there issues in your neighborhood? Are the issues more with rental properties, which is one of the ones I'm expecting to hear? Um, so we can have a dialogue about that. Um, ignitability of structures, do you feel like this is an issue with the Sea Ranch? Um, insurance? Uh, insurance issues, anybody have their insurance canceled? Yeah. I bet you want to talk about that. Um, I should actually be forthcoming. I completely forgot to mention who my funders are for this project. I got grant funding to write this CWPP. I have grant funding from the Bureau of Land Management. And I also got grant funding, interestingly enough, from Fireman's Fund Insurance. Um, the insurance companies are getting much more interested in joining the dialogue that people are having. So hopefully that will be a good thing. Um, we can also talk about your evacuation disaster plans. Once again, you guys are way ahead of the pack um, with all of this stuff. So there we have it. On. Thank you. three major components of fuel management at Sea Ranch. One of them is our fuel management program that I'll spend most of my time talking about. I'm also going to talk briefly about Public Resources Code 4291 that Claire Leone also talked about. And I'm going to leave any discussion of that to the fire people because they're the experts in that area. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, the recently adopted 7.4 design which has an influence over fuel management at the sea. 
First, the fuels management program. Carol Leone talked about the CWPP identifying risk areas and prioritizing what should be done with respect to fuel management. And our fuels management plan did that. The consultant who worked on it developed a number of goals that I'll go over here briefly. The first goal is safe ingress and egress, and this is mainly from areas where there's limited accessibility. The second goal was to reduce fire intensity around structures that are most at risk at the sea ranch. And as we all know, most of those houses are on the east side of the highway in areas where there's steep topography and considerable amount of fuel. The third goal was to minimize the spread of fires that start east of Highway 1. And the third was to try to keep fires west of Highway The fourth was to try to keep fires west of Highway 1 because that's an area that there's flat topography. Essentially, the fuels are limited, and it's a lot easier for uh, the fire people to control the fire in that area. This is a portion of our fuel, fuels management plan. And there are basically fuel, four or five fuel treatment types that occur in this plan. And they're described here in this legend up here that you can see, and I'll go over each one individually. The major fuel treatment types are the roadside fuel breaks, which address that ingress and egress issue. Downslope calming zones, which are intended to address the homes that are most at risk on the east side of the highway. An improved Highway 1 fire break, which is intended to address uh, an important source of ignition, which might be Highway 1. Reduced fuel zones, which are intended to limit the spread and intensity of fires, especially on the east side of the highway, but also on the west side and of course our, our grazing program. I'm going to look at each fuel treatment type individually. This is a roadside fuel break in a forest zone. There's two types of roadside fuel breaks. The meadow fuel break, roadside fuel breaks, and forested. This is a before shot. This is the after shot, and it's a little unclear here because it's so dark a slide. But these trees have been essentially limbed up. And the intent here is if a fire was to ignite along this road, that it would stay in the understory. It's removal of that ladder field that Carolion talked about. Also, if there was a fire in this area, the, f the fact that there's not ladder fuel makes it a better opportunity for, for firefighters to get into that area and for you to get out. This is a, a meadow roadside fuel break, a before picture and an after picture. And each, each year, this work has to be done. Essentially, it's a, a mowing of a wide strip on either, either side of the road that removes both grass and brush. Again, with the intense of reducing intensity of a fire that might occur on the that area. Downslope calming zone, which is intended to protect houses most at risk. This is a before shot in a forested area, and an after shot, where the trees have been limbed up of their ladder field. This is another after picture, which shows an even much higher canopy, and ideally, We'd like our forest to have a very high canopy with very little in the ground plane except ferns and a closed canopy to keep it shaded. That's the ideal situation. Downslope calming zones also occur in open areas. And in that situation, there would be the removal of the brush and the grazing program would enter into those areas as well to reduce fuel intensity there. Highway 1 fire break. This is a before shot showing a considerable amount of fuel right along the edge of the highway. <coughs> the the cast-off cigarette or an accident along the highway can start a fire in a situation like this. Our fuel management plan includes 
the removal of ladder fuel in these areas. So in case there is a fire that starts along the Highway 1, which is down below there, that it would run underneath the tree canopy, making it a lot easier for firefighters to control the fire and slowing its spread. There's also areas along Highway 1 where the flat topography allows us to actually create a down to mineral soil fire break. But also included with that is additional mowing. And this area here would eventually be tilled as part of our program down to mineral earth. So in the event of a cigarette starting a fire here, we would first have to run into this mineral earth area before we could get across. Reduce fuel zone. Considerable amount of fuel in this picture on the east side of the highway. The after sh shot, it shows a lot of that fuel removed and also the vegetation separated quite widely. Also in this picture, the sheep have recently gone through here, so it's a combination of those kind of things that occur with our fuel management and reduced fuel zone. Finally, the grazing program. In this shot, you can see the mode areas around homes that are required by 4291. But then the heavy thatch around those mode areas. And the grazing program is in intended to reduce the biomass and therefore the intensity of a fire. There's another before shot that shows an area where coastal scrub has started to invade this meadow. Also note this fir tree here. <coughs> The after picture, after the sheep have gone through, you can see how heavily browsed these coyote brush are, and if they're small enough, it will effectively kill them. The same with the trees. This intense pressure over the years will eventually restore this to a meadow that it was before. In the absence of, of this kind of grazing pressure, we would see our meadows eventually reduced to coastal scrub in certain areas, or also forest. The, that fir tree is an example. It's grown high enough so it's just beyond the brow, so it would keep growing. However, if it was shorter than that, the sheep and goats would eventually eliminate it. <laughs> I don't know if it's 24-7, but it's a good chunk anyway. Um, one thing that we like about the grazing program is it is the, perhaps the most environmentally sensitive and economically feasible way of reducing fuels in our meadows and also a great long-term program to keep meadows as meadows. Again, back to the plan. It's comprehensive in nature because it addresses fuels ranch-wide. It also prioritizes risks, and it also ignores private property lines in doing that. Again, going back to some of our fuel treatment types, you can see up in this area, these are the roadside fuel breaks in units three, four, and five on the south end of the ranch. The purple is the downslope calming zones, which is just below the homes there. The reduced fuel zones on both sides of Highway 1 that limit the spread and intensity of fire. And the blue represents the grazing program. You can't see it in this picture, but the Highway 1 fire break goes both north and south of Annapolis Road. Central section of the Sea Ranch showing the same thing. And the north end. As John Fox mentioned, we started our, the current program, this is uh, the third initiation, initiation of fuel management since I've been here at the Sea Ranch, and each one becoming a little bit more and more aggressive. We started the current program in 2002, and as John mentioned, we are in the re-entry phase of the program now. Um, the board of directors has really institutionalized this program. It's no longer in a DNR budget that they have to vote on every year. It's in the operations budget because 
so it has become institutionalized. It's also part of our 25-year commons management plan. And it's also a dynamic <coughs> program because we're constantly looking at changes to it, working with the CDF and with neighbors. And this is part of that review as well, what we're doing today. Okay, the second piece of the fuel management puzzle at the Sea Ranch is Public Resources Code 4291. And it's a state law that requires defensible space around your home. It applies only to structures, and it is the responsibility of the homeowner to carry out that work. Uh, oftentimes, our fuel management plan uh, complements <coughs> what people have done around their home, as you can see in this photograph here, where the sheep are grazing up to a, a mowed area next to that house. And the defensible space guidelines were recently increased by the state of California. It's last year, and they're now in place. And it requires, instead of just a 30-foot defensible space zone, a 100-foot defensible space zone. The first 30 feet of that must be the most intensely managed. And you, for example, if you're in a meadow, you have to mow down to a 4-inch stubble for 30 feet around your house. The remaining 70 feet of that defensible zone would be determined by really what's, what's out there. What, the, what are the fuel types, what are the, the topography, that sort of thing. Trees and shrubs are allowed in that defensible space zone, but one of the biggest limitations of 4291 is the law says it stops at the property line. So a lot of us have homes that are only 5 feet away from the property line or 20 feet away, and that limits your ability to extend your defensible space either onto your neighbor's property or into the common area. To address that, the Board of Directors recently adopted, ended with the Design Committee, adopted 7.4 of the Design Manual, which effectively empowers homeowners to extend their defensible space beyond their property line, meeting the spirit of 4291. The rule provides for a process to carry out that defensible space management. And it also allocates the cost to the owner that benefit, benefits from that fuel management. This is sort of a generic example of how that might happen. The home here, the red is the property line, the blue might be your restricted private line, common area out here, the restricted private and commons are both association responsibility areas under the CCNRs. But what 7.4 does is allow this homeowner to extend his mow zone into the common area here and into the RP, meeting the spirit of 4291 guidelines. It also extends out, this, this green line is the 100 foot zone. And it may extend even out to our grazing program or other fuel management activities that we might do. Reduce fuel zones, downslope calming zones, those kinds of things might complement what this homeowner has done. So basically there's three pieces of fuel management puzzle here. One of them is the association's fuel management plan. Another is Public Resources Code 4291, which is the responsibility of the owner, and Rule 7.4, which empowers homeowners to meet the spirit of 4291. So in a way, fuel management here is indeed a collaborative effort between the association, between the CDF that has the responsibility for 4291 and the homeowner. And that it's the end of my Okay, well, we are uh, right on the schedule. This is where we want to be at 3.05. Uh, I think you can see that there's a, a major opportunity here. You've got the fuel management program. You've got the CWPP that's going to revive 
rely very heavily on individual concerns about their immediate space. Uh, John referred to the disaster operations group. You, you see there's a map up here about the incident command system that's been set up as a mechanism for uh, communication in case of uh, events like this. So we have a lot of resources that we can bring to bear and uh, they are not, they're not going to be redundant or overlapping if we manage them properly. They're just going to be, uh, make a very strong tool. So we're, we're going to now uh, break. We're going to take exactly 10 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A section, and we'll have a panel up here to answer your immediate question. So we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. That will be uh, <laughs> Jim Platts. I'm the chair of this uh, forest fire risk reduction group that is uh, a carry-on function of the Commons Management Plan. It was a, a separate area that we felt needed to be evaluated separate from the Fuel Management Plan. And so that's that's what, how we are where we are today. Now, we also have with us uh, Mike Lane, who has a number of maps that we may want to have on the screen to help with answering uh, questions as we as they come up and keeping ourselves oriented on what location we're talking about. Uh, and we're, we appreciate the piece here. So what we're going to do now is we will have the question and answer period. There, you will be allotted a 10-minute interval. And at the end of your two minutes, if you haven't finished your talk, you need to go, if we have a long line, you go to the end of the line to come back with your second two-minute shot, and we'll, we'll get them all uh, through. What will be very helpful here is if questions can focus on the CWPP, if you need clarification of the process, or you want, you think that you saw something there that, that seems to be omitted from the process, we want to hear about that. Specific issues about your trees in and around your property, your particular unit and lot, are best held to the next workshop. That's the kind of information that should be on that form. Now, the form, uh, there's a box on the rear table for forms that are filled out today. That they should be placed there. They can be dropped off at the TSRA office. We're going to post the form, form on the website. We'll make general announcements about its availability. It will also, we'll have our workshop, and then following the workshop, there'll be another uh, access to the form in the, in the bulletin. So um, we can move, uh, I think we can cover things quite effectively. Let's just uh, try to restrict ourselves to the, the CWPP and, the, uh, and its process. So I'd like to ask those who have questions to come to the microphone, form the usual queue back there, and we will start the process. We have our experts up here. I'd ask the first in the beginning, uh, the expert who's going to answer to uh, give their name again so it's all clear who, who everybody is. Okay, um, let's lead off. If you'll give your name, your unit, lot number, and if we come to what we have up here is a flip chart too, but there's some key action items that we think that we, that we talk should get follow-up, just so they don't get lost. We're going to ask, uh, we have uh, Deanna here is going to make a note of them. If there's anything like rules and regulations or things where we need to consult outside, uh, we'll get, get that. Okay, why don't we start the uh, question and answer. Hi, I'm Tom Osborne in 30 Is everybody here? Da -da -da -da. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, unit 3, lot 41. I have a, a question on uh, filling out the form because it seems to me that uh, a lot of this is in the eye of the beholder. And where I might think I have great danger, someone else may not think that it's great danger. So it seems like there, to me that there should be a very objective process for deciding who's in trouble. And I suggest that we may get some information uh, from some hard science. Uh, I have given Jim Platt, by the way, some data that has some people that have done some very good arithmetic. And as some of you up there know, I did submit a paper to you guys that uh, said 
how high you have to cut your tree limbs to keep them from going. Now, whether or not you took it or not, but I did notice that the height went up by about four feet after I gave you the thing. <laughs> <laughs> if it's coincidence, lucky for me. But anyway, where's the science? It's out there. And uh, how do people moderate their measurements on the, the form to make some coherent attack so you can read it? Thank you. And um, I was actually just discussing that very question first thing when I got up here because, you know, obviously most, most people's perceptions of their wildfire risk, what I have found out there doing inspections and so on and so forth is that people's perceptions of wildfire risk tend to be much higher than firefighters' perception of wildfire risk, typically. Um, I think that it's a, it's a very frightening prospect. And uh, the firefighters I uh, tend to be less concerned about issues often than, than people are because they are basing their opinions on their experiences watching what fires do, how they behave. And also there is solid, solid data that's coming from CDM in terms of um, fuels availability, slope, and so on. And so, um, that would be the idea with this form, is that we will take the information, which is anecdotal, completely anecdotal. All you are doing is telling me what you as a community are concerned about. Um, and then that, those issues will be uh, compared to fuel models, slope, um, and so on. And then a final risk category will be arrived on after that. So. If I got 12 letters saying, I think that my risk is really high, and I know that it's a flat place with no trees around it, they're going to get a low fuel risk rate. Uh, and maybe that's a good opportunity for education primarily. Does that answer your question? Partly. <laughs> well, I think the answer would be that you would put down the areas of concern and your evaluation of it, and then the experts would follow up later and, and see how it fits. I certainly don't want you to be shy about listening to your concerns. I think, I think it's a model to try and apply science to it, but I don't think it applies. And the reason is, is that um, your, project, your, your perception of safety is not rational. It's your, it's, it's your, uh, it's your feeling about what is safe, and that's different for everybody. And if you're going to tell me that this is safe because the numbers um, show that it's safe, then all I have to do is change the variables and it's not safe anymore. So I think it's, it's actually an emotional response, not a scientific response. That's just another way of looking at it. Who's, who's emotional response? Mine or yours? <laughs> Anybody whose safety is at risk? No, I'm saying that there, there is uh, an answer. There, there, there is an answer for the, for the, if you have a bunch of trees up there and I say I don't have a problem, you say I have a problem, or vice versa, uh, they're, they're a long way away and I say I don't have, I do have a problem, you say I don't. There's an answer to that and it's not going to be, uh, and, and so I do believe that science has the ability to come up and say, yeah, it's a problem, no, it's not a problem. Do you agree with that? Sure. Is there it depends on the of course it does. It depends on the what I'm after is to get those variables, and that was right. what was in the paper that I gave to you. Is, um, is your concern with trees that are more than 100 feet from your home? Perhaps? I don't know. A, a, a big tree that's more than 100 feet away may be a problem. I don't think so. Right. But I do know that when a tree fires off, I do know that a 10 foot high weight uh, front of fire is 1 meter wide, that's 30 feet high by 10, 1 meter wide is 38 megawatts. And that's the same thing as 10,000 household ovens going full bore. Yeah, but, but how does that ignite your house? Say again? How does that ignite your house? That's also in the paper. It says how much energy it takes, how much time it takes to ignite a house. A house that has a lot of, what do you call those little things that come out when it looks good? Trim, you know, the, you have siding and it has these little... No, no, the little pieces of wood that split off. Split, split, split. split. That's more dangerous than one that has no splits, you know. So, but all this is measurable. 
So as far as that concern go, just that um, what your concern, your your concern that you're expressing is about uh, first off forest fuels. My concern is that there is a pro there 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 is science out there that can help us immensely, and it's not. All hearsay and I think and that. I okay, mean, so you're, you're I'm, I'm sorry, my, our point in this meeting today is to, for me to quantify your concern. So your concern is that science is not being applied to my the concern modeling is that, that you can My concern is that if you really knew, if you, if you really were able to do the computation, you wouldn't be asking me, you'd be telling me. Okay. I'm just playing devil's advocate. Okay. Well, uh, hey. but, but I don't agree. And the reason I don't agree is because who knows what's safe? What defines safe? When my house doesn't burn down and I don't go with it. You know? <laughs> that's just you want to guarantee that it's not going to burn down? I come closer than some people, I think. I mean, how, how close do you come? Well, let's put it this way. Do you know what I mean, Tom? I mean, you know, for me, I'm not worried about it because I'm not going to be there anymore. Yeah. So, we, had, we had a conversation once and I told him about so down Tom, the Tom, Tom, your concern is that oh, hard good. science data is not being applied to the fuels management right. and the CRA. Okay, we got it. Thanks. Okay, we'll, we'll talk some other Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> that doesn't always work. <laughs> Derek Ray, Unit 17, Lockwood 78. Uh, my concern is uh, defensible space. Um, you know, one of the important aspects of 4291 is that they emphasize the requirement for 100 foot defensible space, but then they limit the homeowner's responsibility to a property line if that's less than 100 feet. You know, fortunately for Sea Ranch, at this point in time, we do have a rule 1.03 that clearly defines the responsibilities for adjacent properties, including associations, areas, you know, commons uh, adjacent to properties. This rule, in my opinion, would certainly allow for expanding on PRC 4291 and provide for a comprehensive use of defensive space throughout Sea Ranch. My question is, how important do you think the association's role is going to be in supporting this rule 1.03 for an effective defensible space solution. Should the association be taking a leading role in such a program and providing for an expansion of the fuels management plan and to implement the 4291 uh, the forest service guidelines? I think, Derek, you might have a better sense of this than even I do, being on the Board of Directors, uh, given that the Board of Directors appears to be headed towards adopting a revised 1.03 and using what I just described in 7.44 as a, as a method for individual homeowners to meet the requirements of Fort 291 beyond their property line. Um, as far as I know, I don't know the exact wording, but the vegetation management 7.4 or whatever it is, refers to 1.03 as it exists today. And uh, that seems to be the, you know, 1.03 does actually determine that the, so the uh, adjacent properties do have a certain responsibility. I, I think the, in the, the CCNRs, it talks about private loan owners keeping their lot in a fire safe condition. And, and since the board is in the midst of revising Rule 1.03, I don't know how much more I should talk about that. John, do you have any? Any comment about that? I really, Jared, with all due respect, this is not the purpose of today's gathering. I didn't intend to bring up the potential revision. I was just trying to relate to what exists on the books today. 
and wanted to know whether or not you think this is a good idea that the association should be following the guidelines, the intent of Rule 1.0 through this stance, where the association does have a certain responsibility for these adjacent properties. Well, as a practical matter and in, in practice, the association has never carried out that goal. And, and I think it's the impracticability of it that the logistics of carrying out a program like that and the cost to the association and the logic, really, uh, seems to indicate, and this is my sense of the from the last board meeting, that that individual homeowner who benefits from that fuel management would be responsible for doing that. This is going to be a big change, but I think it's probably something, as John said, we should be discussing at the board meeting. Okay, next, who else would like to uh, go in? Jim, could I ask a question from, since I can't go over there? What is the provision if the next door neighbor doesn't uh, comply 
and you have, and this isn't our problem, but I'm just a general question. You have a lot of high grass right next to your house, but the neighbor isn't taking care of it. What does the association do in that case? Will they be in, will they be forced to comply or because there are a lot of cases like that where a vacant lot is sitting there well overgrown adjacent to somebody's house. How do they deal with that? State, state law, it goes to your property owner, the association has other rules. Okay. Uh, your CCNRs say that as a lot owner, you have to keep your lot in a quote unquote fire safe condition. And in practice, what has occurred is neighbors have cooperated with one another. It, it's the most reasonable way to go about carrying out your defensible space beyond your property line onto your neighbor's property. But because the CCNR state that you have to keep it in a fire safe condition, that big lot, the association can come in, do that work, and build you for it. However, rather than create a bureaucracy that does that, what we ask people do, to do is first communicate with your neighbor. Try to work it out amongst yourselves so the association doesn't have to spend its time and resources doing that sort of thing. What we'd rather do is spend our time and resources more comprehensively on the fuel management plan than dealing with individual homes. In the event you aren't able to reach cooperation with your neighbor, then you need to come to the association and we'll address it. Thank you very much. 
Um, we left these forms at the, at the back. This is just a sample of what we're looking at. And this is the inspection form the inspectors are going to come out and use. So we'll come up to the door, back to the door. When you were here, we're going to do an inspection and go to an inspection. And these are what we're looking for. Public Resources Code 4291, which is the state law, is basically the, the first rules. But we also want to look for all the rules that, that you folks have up here in the C Ranch. We're looking for compliance. We don't want to have to enforce any law. I haven't written a ticket up here in a long time. You can actually get a ticket if you don't comply and seek infraction, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for compliance, and we haven't had really any problems in the city. We have the legal right to check your property, believe it or not, and then to chase us off. We can't trespass. We can look, what is the legal term, from in front and look at your yard, and if there's a violation, we can know that that, that is our right. But we, we don't need to go there to see that. We don't see that. So what we try to target areas, I can tell you they're going to start out in the areas that have heavy fuel because those are the folks that need the most time to get the clearance and possibly get a burn permit and burn some of the brush or however they want to get rid of it. So we're going to start up there. But we are going to work on trying to get the full range. I doubt we're going to do it this year, but you know that's our goal. We have to have goals. So does that answer your question? One. And, and then the second one, Charles, which is a, a question that statements that others are making that I'm just putting here as a concern. Some people are concerned about the amount and the increase in what they call the fuel load. So I would like uh, maybe Dan and Sally and you to uh, address that issue on the Sea Ranch, uh, whether you consider that a uh, danger or not. Um, well, absolutely. Um, there is a geometric increase in fuel load. That's about how we're going to manage that fuel. We do need to reduce it. I mean, when I came here in, in 77, um, the meadows were absolute meadows. They were, and, and there had been really no spread yet of, of the pine cone plantations. They were only eight years old when I came here or something like that. So there is a big difference, and it is an increasing fuel load. Um, but I don't think you can arbitrarily say that the fuel load is, is uh, is high and we have to reduce it and that gets to work. Because you have to start somewhere and you have to have an objective. And it's really a design problem, just like the original scene. And so I think that's why this process is so valuable. Because we can collectively make some decisions about what what level of risk we're willing to accept in this community. You know, if you don't want to if you don't want to risk anything, pay it. Right? From the bridge all the way down. You might have uh, water problems, but <laughs> now they're in the fire risk. Um, then the question is, if everybody agrees we don't do that, then what do we do that's less than that? What, what do we do between paving and no rent? And I think that's the struggle we've had all these years, is to try and identify what is acceptable to the community. And then I think we have a formal process to do that for the first time, uh, where, where we reach out to all community members and get their input and find out who's horrified by the idea of taking down that, that pump of coal pine over there and who thinks it ought to go back. So, does, does that answer your question? I just raised it as a general topic to see what you're being And I don't think it's your view also, sir. I mean, if the, if the question is do we need to manage the fuel, the answer is absolutely. Otherwise, we have an unrestrained hazard. So then the question is how do we do that? And over the years, you know, this is the, if we call this a fuel management effort, this is the fifth one that I've seen. And uh, um, they've all worked. They've all raised people's awareness. Um, they haven't worked as well as people hoped they were, but they were serial increases in commitment on the part of the community to manage the fuel. Now we're at a point where we need to make some decisions about how we do that. We understand the basics. We've done through the uh, the last management plan, we've done the basics. Now we need to do more advanced questions. What mass, fuel masses do we want to remove? And why do we want to remove them? And does it have to do with forest health? Does it have to do with view restoration? Not for good, for good measure. Measure that work, but that's part of the equation. And do they have to do with fire protection? 
and let's get together and get people's ideas about them, get them on paper, and then get to work. That's that's my view. Right. Um, Sandra Bush, and I'm um, I'm in Unit 28, Lot 32, and on the board. Um, I'm going to bring this up at the March 10th issue uh, meeting, but I've got a huge 20-year-old coyote bush that I just love, and it's up against my fence. <laughs> and my wood pile has a composition, whatever it is, safe roof on it, which is abutting my house. And in a fire that would come through my metal, because I'm in a boggy unit, but it does get dry, if, the, if we've got water and water pressure, if I get out there and water that coyote bush, <laughs> is that going to not ignite? I, I hate to take away the quail and the bunny place they live in there at my home. So I'm buying that risk right now every day. But I'm taking out the, the dead underneath. <clears throat> but I know coyote bush is like... Well, let me address that. This is exactly what I was talking about in terms of developing an acceptable level of risk. For you, that tree is important, that kind of is important, and you're willing to accept a higher risk to, to preserve that. That's the question we have to ask ourselves about the whole place. Um, and the answer to your question is, will it survive a fire? It entirely depends on what the weather conditions are at the time, where the wind is, uh, and what kind of people is here. Is, uh, and how close is it to your house again, to your structure? Is it, mm -hmm. is it right up against the structure? It's against the fence, which is against my structure. Which moves up to the fence. Well, there might be creative ways that you can work around that. But um, the thing that I wanted to say in response to both of these things are, um, you know, once again, I think it's, it's uh, fuels management is really important. Um, how flammable is your house? Is that, <laughs> um, you know, and, and what are you, you know, and, and, and so and maybe you need to, the, the steps, we need to start looking at the steps that you can take to make the house less ignitable, um, and then kind of balance the concerns with the coyote brush as much as is possible. But um, once again, you know, I think that it's really important that everybody remember the, the degree of importance of household ignitability and very important part of this discussion. And actually, I think if you look at the data, you'd be surprised. Because the data um, right now is tending to show that natural woods that are intact with no, uh, with no checks and no splits in the tongue of the roof um, will actually withstand a tremendous amount of fire. Just like the photograph that we saw in my presentation. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that shingles, because they have so many cracks in them, are, are very dangerous. Mm -hmm. The data is surprising. We may not have to eliminate which blue beside the entire of the so we can do a little different. Along that same line, I'm Mel Gers, uh, in 1976, Hillside, uh, weather, 27 year old shingles. Um, I hear the same about the principal space and all that, but my perception is that other people neighbors and such. You try to imagine a hot fire in the summertime and blowing embers, and I don't see a defensible space. You can, you can call it a thousand feet what makes any difference. You know, we got tall trees all over the place, and when it's blowing, those embers are going to go. And I can't imagine a house mine like mine surviving. So my question is, the type of house I described, is there really a defensible space? Let me speak both as an architect and a firefighter. Okay. I think absolutely. If you look at the intention of the defensible space, it's to reduce the fire intensity so that the fire department can get into that space and, and put out the fire. Um, there are cases where even if there was defensible space, it wouldn't be too dangerous to go in. So the fire intensity is such that, that it's doing exactly what you're talking about, where it's uh, it blow torch I'm not going to. It doesn't matter what kind of materials it is. But that doesn't happen very much. That happens down south, it doesn't happen here. I'm sorry. And it's prior meeting. I, I, I heard you say that when the, when the big when the big fire comes, the 
way of looking, you got what it's going to take. Maybe three or four homes are actually going to be protected. So That's right. That goes back to my my question. I don't I don't believe there is a defensive space. It's gone. Yeah. Well, I, I think that you're concerned about your side of right? Yeah, but it's not just my home. It's, I mean, you just say this is this really there's, 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 there's a lot of homes like mine. So I, I'm I, what I'm saying is, if a house, if, if where it's located, and the condition of that that siding is such a point, I I I would I would argue that there isn't a dispensable space and a significant fire that takes place because the blowing embers are going to totally cover that ground. I disagree. Case in point, Oakland Hills fire. There were several houses that had wood chip sides. There is a principle space that can happen. It can happen, and nothing's hotter than the Open Hills fire, let me tell you. Yeah, can you get your microphone? Sure. I don't, I don't think I've been to a fire hotter than the Open Hills fire where underground safes had jewelry in them and they melted, and wood shake sided houses did survive because they had the principle space. So there, there, it is. It is true. Well, one of my neighbors that made the comment was a disabled fireman. Mm -hmm. He fought the open fire. Mm -hmm. so and, he, and he does not see that, that my home would be successful. I'd like to look at your home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if your question is, does the principal space work? I'm sure it works under certain terms, but I, it, you can always describe it. a worst case scenario, and that's what I was trying to describe. And I think in a worst case scenario, there's there's homes at Sea Ranch because of the construction by a home, and, and that is on the side. I, and you're on the hillside, and the big one comes with the blowing embers. I don't consider it defensible. Well, I don't I don't agree with you in the conclusion, but I agree with you in evaluating the factors. Um, it is certainly it is certainly going to be less uh, effective. Than if there were other conditions for flat, and if it were uh, impact new siding, but I'm doing all the I'm doing all the measures. I just I just I'm just making I just had to make a comment. Well, think about the idea that it's not really to save your house; it's to allow people to get in to save their house. And if you get enough of a, of a leg up on reducing the fire intensity, then you can bring equipment in. You know what? My house is so it's, it's so private. You can't see the house. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, the street is not seeable, so. Uh, I, I, I gave you the worst, worst case scenario. Okay. We'll take it as an exercise. Okay. Uh, just, but Dan, uh, sorry, the question. Can people invite their uh, compliance inspection? Thanks for asking that question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I forgot that. Yes, you can call the fire department and ask for inspection. I do ask that you don't have us chasing rabbits and inspecting other folks. <laughs> that you don't like. Yeah. <laughs> really, I mean, there's some folks that just have that in their mind. But if you would like your house inspected, absolutely call and ask me about it. Kathy Gordon, uh, unit 35A, plot 94. I have a question on the fuel management plan and the schedule for clearing or for uh, minimizing brush. Uh, in our area, there's a great deal of dead vegetation, dead trees, uh, some kind of disease has gotten into it. And I wonder if there's any way of modifying the schedule to come in and treat that dead vegetation before it comes up on the schedule again. Yeah, that, that is something we'll definitely look at. If you notice something in your neighborhood that you would like to see addressed sooner then later, then we're happy to come out and look at that. And and we have modified our management plan and the timing of it to do just what you suggest. Um, we may get a lot of requests for that kind of thing. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of this process as far as requests. And we'll have to just simply adjust to the materials and resources we have to deal with that. But uh, we're happy to look at that. And the CDF has been helpful to us as well when they go out and do their inspections. Uh, I have a list from Shelly Spear of areas that she would like to see our fuel management plan extended so they can effectively fight fires better around homes. So 
So that's that's part of the process that's happening too. Okay, let's continue. Uh, we might have about five more minutes of questions, but uh, we want to get everybody's questions. So if you have questions, please uh, queue up now, please. We want everybody to participate. Yeah. Gary Weaver, uh, what is it? Minute 12, lot 46. Uh, I'm trying to get some clarity here. The CCNR require the association, property and all of us collectively, to have responsibility for maintaining commons there. And while we've done a pretty good job of maintaining the commons uh, field management for uh, grasslands and along the highway and things like that with sheep and everything else, it's pretty much totally been ignored for the life of the sea ranch, the forest of areas. And now I read from the board that they have a, a resolution proposal to put that responsibility onto the individual property owners who, whose land abuts commons. So let's say in the forest. Well, if the association isn't doing their responsibility in those areas, then what's the kind of association that require the property owner to spend the money to go in, say, 60, 40 feet or whatever into the commons to maintain a 100-foot defensible area? How are they going to do that? And why have we implemented this over the years? Why, why haven't we taken care of our whole landscape to make us more fire safe? Can someone explain that? How do we make the property owner do this? Does this thing so called empowering? I, as I expressed to uh, Director Gray, I don't think this is the right forum for that discussion. We're here to try to promote um, additions to the existing plan. Uh, there's going to be a board meeting in the future where this will be on the agenda. I recommend that you bring it up at that time. Well, isn't, uh, in addition to the existing plan, wouldn't that also be part of implementing what we already have in place as far as policies and rules? I, I, I think your question inherently mixes um, board policy with uh, the construction of an operation here to move forward. I don't think this is the right forum for that discussion. So, fundamentally, what Eric has said about his fuels on the In terms of your yeah, 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 expressed concern for what I'm looking at for today, he's very expressed concern. Right. You're expressing concern about fuels on the commons lands and who's responsible for maintaining Exactly. Well, the responsibility lies right now in the CCNR as a crew. So, well, I think this is a good topic. We'll put it down as fuel management on the commons so this gets addressed. Yeah. yeah. That's, for that's me, a big part of the fuel load. Fuel for me, the issue is what, what the hell are we going to do with all this authority? And that's the purpose of the uh, fairly own study. What do we need to do? Okay. How do we get something else? important that we can't make it here that it doesn't escape. All right. Good. All right. I'm wondering about how all of this fits in with some other objectives. I've got an approved planting plan between my house and my neighbor's house that hasn't been put in yet, but it's not 30 feet from either structure. Um, all the pictures I see that show the 30 foot um, defensible space show no vegetation at all. I don't see any houses like that. I get assured that you can put vegetation there, but we need some, I've got that. Pretty, pretty good guidance, I think, is the question you're asking. Okay. Uh, but I guess it's real good guidance on, if you look at that, it's not all there in the room of your house. So you can follow these guidelines. That's just one. Yeah. But I think that's a good action on okay. how individual landscape plans have to fit in the <laughs> consistency between this and other programs. So I think that's what we have to do. And, and the general issue I'm concerned about is, is keeping multiple objectives in place. There is not, there's fire safety, but there's also the, the, um, the views and the screening and the enjoyment of the landscape, the wildlife protection. There's a lot of things going on when you start messing with this stuff. Okay. 
Just say everything is connected to everything else. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melinda Lloyd. Um, I just wanted to, I can't speak in public. I get so tired of things happening. Good for you. I'm just so and just babble. But anyway, um, I wanted, I was thinking about what um, Mel said, who's still here. Um, the, the question sort of can be um, related to earthquakes. You can take a lot of precautions to be safe in an earthquake. And you can write out, if you do those things, um, a 6.8 earthquake, like we did in that Loma Creative, because um, we were in there. Um, however, if it's an 8 point whatever, how, I don't know how high the numbers go, very few things are going to survive. So, and I'm kind of really kind of wanted to respond to this because I heard somebody say there's not so much fuel while you do anything that's going to burn, but it's a matter of taking reasonable means for, um, the, the, the most likely scenario. And the most likely scenario here um, it isn't something like Malibu. It may happen, um, but um, so I encourage this program, um, aggressively <laughs> encourage it, and would like to see it go forward um, at, at, at a good pace and, and with lots of involvement. Thank you. <laughs> um, the worst, worst, worst case scenario is that uh, we're in a red fire uh, iron zone, and we know there are pressurized in a small tank. I think it's 30 some psi. Um, is there action being taken to increase the amount of water? That's up there on the hillside, even fire fire? What are you asking Ken to do? Well, I'm sure it can be done. I'm just saying, it's, it's, uh, there's hardly any water in the tank, and it's in a slow fire. That's, that's certainly why it's wrong. I think that's a little bit of a show. As you will have read in the bulletin many times, I'm sure there was a um, the association spending money on the development of a master plan for the utilities and the board system. And uh, a consultant is currently evaluating the entire water system for all of these factors and is uh, about to make some recommendations. So uh, there is a plan in place to remedy any deficiencies. Great, thank you for the response. Thank you. And let me add something. Uh, we don't really need the water system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't believe we have tenders and we have other resources. The water system makes it quicker and easier and safer. Okay, but otherwise, we have resources. That well, work. what happens to the stuff? Like this, like you guys busy and have the fires. Uh, I'm a fireman, and if I don't, if I don't have, if the homes don't have the water, we don't have the pressure. It doesn't work. Right. Okay. That's that's what I'm getting about the defense zone. Uh -huh. Thank you. We should we should all recognize that have our Sea Ranch Water Company and. Uh, uh, the board's control is, is just a huge major plus and an asset for all of us. I was involved in the 93 Laguna fire when uh, the, the nearest reservoir ran out of water. And uh, I think that because of the planning that's being undertaken here, uh, we probably won't have that kind of a problem. And uh, so I think we should count, and count our chickens. We're very lucky to have that resource. All right, on that note, all right, very good. I'd uh, like, uh, Dan, would you write an email up there address? It's custer at ambercnn.org. <laughs> all right. Um, DVDs of these proceedings are shortly going to be available. Uh, Walt Custer has been taping this, and you can get uh, a DVD at uh, custer at ambercnn.org. Maybe a week, ten days. Maybe tomorrow. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> in the queue. If you stay home. <laughs> Is there a charge for that? A buck, which is a cost.
if you pick them up. If you pick them up. Three bucks or you want it mailed to you. Very good. I have 30 seconds. Okay. I want to put out a appeal for anybody who's interested in joining the fire department. Yes. We need you. Come, to, uh, come by the station at any time. And we'll talk to you about it. And if you don't have this book, get it off the back table. It's the black one. But I would very much like to thank our experts, our panel here that did the presentation. I think it was effective and there's a lot of valuable information in there. We really need your input on those forms. There's a white box back here so that we, uh, we ask that you put them in there. Be sure you've registered so that we can follow up with you. And uh, so I'd like to thank everybody and I appreciate you all coming. Thanks very much.